Tom Eastman with serialization formats aren't toys. Yeah. Hi, who uses XML? Do you like it? Yay. Do you use YAML instead? Yeah. Do you like it? Yeah. Awesome. I'm gonna no, you're supposed to say yes. Um, <laughs> everything I'm about to show you is a feature, not a bug. This is all there by design. It's there for you to use. You're going to love it. Um, this is the code I'm using just as an example. As you can see, it's a, it's a bottle app, but don't worry about that. It's not complicated. I'm importing the serializer, and then I'm parsing. I'm importing XML, and then I'm parsing XML. I'm importing XML, and then I'm parsing XML. That's all you need to know. Loading data into your app is the most boring part of your day. You want to do stuff with that data. So you're just going to go, OK, import YAML. Hey, it worked. YAML dot tab. Oh, there's a thing called load. I'll use that. That's great. So this is some YAML, and this is the Python dictionary that you get out of it when you parse it. So far, so good. This is a cool little thing that YAML does. You tell it a module and an object, and it will instantiate one of those things for you. So that's how YAML does object serialization and deserialization. That's really useful. That's a feature. That's something they did on purpose. But look at the cool stuff you can do with it. It'll quite happily use subprocess to go check output, and it'll just happily shell out, right? So who uses YAML load? Keep your hands up as I go through some of these slides. Excellent. I know that Heat uses like um, configuration in YAML or something. Anyway, sweet. Spoiler. <laughs> so what other fun things can you do? So just instantiate an instance of the system object and call it with that argument, rm star. And no kidding, I actually had to restart working on this talk. <laughs> so that's my home directory, gone. If you use yaml.load, then people can do whatever they want to your computer. Surely this doesn't actually happen in real life, right? OK, November 2011, it hit Tasty Pie. It was at the time, no, that's not Tasty Yeah, Tasty Pie and Piston, the uh, two most common REST frameworks for Django at the time. Um, in January 2013, it happened to Rails, and we made fun of them. And then it happened six weeks later, and we just felt bad for them. <laughs> it happened to Puppet in 2013, and <sighs> I was deeply disappointed in that. And then it happened to Node, and nobody cared. <laughs> How do you actually protect yourself from this? It's really, really, really easy. Make the parser stupider. That feature is not a feature that you realized was there, and it's not actually a feature that you probably want, especially if you're just dealing with configuration files. I did have access to the clock. No, it's gone. Um, with YAML, it's really trivial. All you have to do is use this thing called safe load. And this drives me crazy because, of course, you went yaml.tab, and you found a thing called load, and it did what you wanted. You didn't go down to the bottom of the list and find something called safe load and go, oh, I wonder why there's a safe load. What does that imply about load? And in Ruby, you have to install an external module that actually monkey patches the YAML thing. And apparently, that's just how Ruby works, Gary. <laughs> Who uses XML? How much time do I have left? Oh, that's not enough time to talk about XML. <laughs> OK, this is called an XML entity. And it's just a Unicode code that's defining a little smiley. But if you are feeding things to an XML parser, a fully compliant XML parser, which all of them are because they market themselves as compliant, you can define document types. And that lets you do things like defining entities. So you can have a little Unicode thing there. And I can call it smiley. And then I can go a little smiley there. And I get my little smiley there, right? That's awesome. But I can also do an entity, which is a bunch of entities, which is a bunch of entities, which is a bunch of entities. So with one little S4, which is a bunch of S3s, which is a bunch of S2s, I can get lots of happy people <laughs> until you do this. Who's seen this before? What's it called? Wrong. This is the 168 million laughs attack because I actually had to delete one thing off of the end to make it fit on the slide. <laughs> so, but the point is, your compliant XML parser will fall over and die because this takes about a couple terabytes of RAM to try and fit the parse tree one in. One minute. What else can we do with XML rather than just blowing up people's computers? Well, that entity doesn't have to be a little Unicode smiley face. It can be a system file on your parser's computer. The parser's computer is probably, because you're using XML, it's probably some sort of enterprise Java type thing, which means it's running as root, so it can read any file on the file system. And if that parser, if the output of that parser ever gets reflected back to the user, then you've got a way of reading whatever file you want on the file system. And even if you were clever and you're not running your server application as root, as in you're not running Oracle, um, <laughs> it'll, it'll still be able to read the file that has the database credentials for your application server, because by definition, your application server has to have access to that file. But that's not all. 
It can be something on someone else's computer. Your application <laughs> server is probably behind your DMZ. It's probably on your internal intranet. It also doesn't have to be port 80. Oh, uh-oh. <laughs> Yay! Stop. Get off. Up next, we have Dominic Schmidt. Uh, on deck, we have William McKee. If you can be down here and ready to go soonishly, that would be fantastic. Uh, and Dominic, uh, your time starts now. <coughs> I love watching people log in during lightning talks. It's one of my favorite things. Um, so I'll be talking about uh, Q Python, things you can edit in the Python layer that uh, might be a good idea. Um, it'll be hard to talk about <laughs> how to code. Can you hold the mic, please? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's make this a little bit bigger so you can see what I'm doing. Hold on. He locked me out before. Let's I try had again. everything uh, prepared be previously. Um. Let's get this easy for now. Oh. That way. I find that typing in the correct name for your program works quite well. <laughs> okay, please don't interrupt me. Right, so <laughs> there's this thing uh, in Python called the ellipsis. It comes from NumPy where you can uh, do slices. Um, port NumPy, I'll make a array real quick. So we have this array. A NumPy does a really cool job of uh, showing it to you. Um, if you want a specific element in this array, uh, you can do the usual thing that you do with uh, two-dimensional arrays in Python. This will give you that element. Um, NumPy also allows you to have a slightly more expanded syntax uh, such that you can do this. It's really useful for multi-dimensional multi arrays. Um, same uh, as in Python, you can uh, get a row. Uh, by just uh, giving the index uh, like this. Um, getting a column in a, a pure Python arrays is uh, really uh, tricky where you have to transpose first before you uh, index it. Um, NumPy has this really cool feature where you can say, similar to this, in uh, any row, give me column number one. And uh, that'll give you this uh, column. So, I started toying around with this uh, because I thought, hey, that's weird. Uh, what is it? Let's see. What's the type of uh, ellipsis? Well, ellipsis. Cool. <laughs> um, uh, then I th started thinking, what could I use this for? Um, turns out in uh, Python, if you define a stub, you have to uh, do parse because the parser needs a function body. Um, but you could also be cute about it and uh, say, oh yeah, just <laughs> uh, there's something that's supposed to be here, let's uh, just put ellipsis there. Um, another uh, cute use uh, would be if I could have, uh, like, everybody here knows range, right? So 4x in uh, range, uh, 1 to 10, uh, print x. Uh, this is Python 3, yay! <laughs> Cool, um, but wouldn't it be kind of cute if we could say uh, sequence from one to, yeah, I'm gonna make it slightly smaller for a second. Whoa, what's up? Uh, if we could uh, do something like this, give it a bunch of examples, let it figure out the sequence, uh, and uh, then uh, just run the sequence. Um, well, Python doesn't have that, but how about now? Hooray! <laughs> um, well, One then minute. I started uh, thinking about uh, what else we can uh, do with this. Uh, what's happening here? Okay. No idea. Uh, for X in I'm fine. Sweet. <laughs> um, well, uh, it doesn't have to be uh, restrained to uh, um, 
linear sequences, it could uh, just uh, also use uh, exponentials if you really wanted to. Yeah. What the, <laughs> the fuck? <laughs> uh, in short, uh, because I'll be running out of time, uh, you can do some uh, fun things uh, like uh, two, three, five, seven, set a dot, and it will give you a list of uh, primes. Hooray. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Yay! Stop! Be faster. Come on, everyone. Uh, Clinton Roy is up on deck. On now is William McKee, and hopefully they're going to be swapping over things at the moment because I'm kind of getting impatient. want to get everyone, everyone on, uh, on stage, so I'm going to start your time at now. Hopefully the it loads. Yay. Okay, I'm going to talk to you about getstrawn.com. Um, this is the website that I made last year. Um, it was created as an alternative to Reddit Get Strawn since I got banned um, for my troll artwork on it. Um, you can go to Reddit Get Strawn and check it out. Um, Okay, it's a Python script. It scrapes the most recent images from Reddit gets drawn. Some of the libraries it uses is Dominate, Beautiful Soup 4, Requests, and actually one really important one, Prowl, which I've missed out on here, which is the uh, Reddit Python wrapper. Um, you can grit, read this, get the script from there. Um, uh, uh, oh, this is horrible. Okay, so it's um, the script runs as a cron job every hour. Um, it downloads the um, images um, into a folder that's sorted by year, month, and day. So I have a nice archive of every image uploaded to Reddit Gets Drawn from the last year. Um, in the future, I want to do the uh, redo the website with um, with a framework. I'm thinking Nikila because it's a static site generator that I'm quite used to and I quite like it. Um, I've got an example of it running, um, and yeah, that's that's all. Okay, so James Mitchell is up on deck. If you can come sit down here somewhere, that would be really useful. Uh, Clinton Roy is now up here to talk to us about PyCon Australia 2016 and 2017, and your time starts now. About three seconds ago. Honestly, I think it's more important that everyone gets a chance to talk than everyone gets their full five minutes. It, you know, <laughs> that's just me. So I just need to... Plus the slight schadenfreude of watching people have tech difficulties on stage. Is kind of fun. Tech though. difficulties? <laughs> <laughs> Yay! Yay! Um... Hi everyone, my name is Clinton. Um, I uh, was the organiser of PyCon Australia this year and last year. Um, so it is with a certain amount of pride um, and not small amount of relief that I get to tell you um, that I'm not organising next year or the year after. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> I deserve that. Um, so these dates are a little bit tenuous yet, but um, you, I, I wouldn't book your flights or accommodation yet, but <laughs> definitely um, pencil them in in your calendar. Um, so in sometimes warmer, sometimes colder Melbourne. Um, uh, in August, so from Friday through to Tuesday. Um, so we'll have all of the normal Pycon AU things. So we'll be having some wonderful keynotes, hopefully as good as the ones here. Um, on the Friday, we will have a few mini comps. Um, these are decided by the community and run by the community. Um, we have 
two days of sprints on the Monday and Tuesday. That's where you guys just get uh, food, um, some internets and coffee, and you go and hack away on things that you want to hack away on. Um, lots and lots of presentations, a few tutorials, and most importantly, uh, a really uh, happy, friendly, and inclusive community around that. So I hope to see as many of you there um, as possible. Thank you very much. Hey. So uh, that was Clinton, so I'm just going to cross you out. Um, Richard Shea, Grant Payton Simpson, and Danny Adair are next up on deck. Uh, James Mitchell is going to talk to us about running Python on AWS Lambda. Time starts now. Cool. Uh, apparently can't use the desktop, so can everybody see that clearly? <laughs> good, good. Um, if you want to follow along, because I see a lot of little laptops out there, just go to talk. Just like it's spelled, I uh, said Mangafau, M A U N G A W H A U, dot net dot nz. Choose any one of the talks. I'm going to do the one about uh, Lambda. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, no. No, it's funnier this way. Um, <laughs> so, uh, I have a lovely matrix, which you can't see, which talks about uh, deployment through the ages. Uh, the ancient pharaohs obviously had to provision their own hardware, buy them, put them into a data center then put operating systems on them, then put the web app on them. Uh, we've come a long way from that. Some people use virtual machines. You don't have to provision the server, but you still got to put the operating system on. You still got to get the web app. Some of us use platforms as a service, and we just care about putting the web app on because everything else is um, done. Lambda brought out, uh, AWS brought out this thing called Lambda. Now, instead of putting your whole web app in one place, you get to put a slice of it, functions. That sounds really cool. I kind of wish they supported more than just Java and Node.js. Damn. However, a bunch of really cunning people figured out that they could do clever things, and they wrote a Node.js wrapper, which does, anyone like to guess? <laughs> it calls to the system and does an exec. Hello, Python, Haskell, I don't care, but you can now run your favorite uh, opera um, system in Lambda. Um, so let's pretend that you can see this. It's a hello world. <laughs> it's a Python <laughs> script. Um, <laughs> great. Um, so just before I go, uh, time, good. Uh, just before I go, the idea with Lambda is that you don't have a full EC2 instance running 24 hours a day, seven days a week, cost, uh, costing you lots of money. No. What you have is a tiny piece of code that is going to be run in, a, in a, a response to an event something in the SNS notification, maybe something turning up in an S3 bucket, maybe an insert, delete, or update on your um, whatever that Amazon database thing is called, or my personal favorite, the API gateway. So really simple REST APIs. You instantiate an API gateway that calls your Lambda function, which in an ideal world is just a tiny little thing that, that runs one thing, uh, one call, says hello world, for instance. If you're willing to live in Python 2.6, that's a 1K upload. I wasn't, so the slide you now can't see shows you that it's a 39 meg upload to get all of your virtual ends of Python 3 up there to say hello world. Only a small but you difference. can do it. Only a small difference. Tiny, it scales and works, works itself. Thank you very much. <laughs> all right, thank you very much, James. Um, Lee Begg is up next on deck. Uh, over here we have a bunch of people who you probably all have seen around here. They tend to be involved in this conference. Uh, they're going to be telling us about the Python promotion booklet. Um, and your time starts now. Yeah, right. Hi. Um, we all know Python's a great language. That's why we're at a Python conference. But a lot of people out there are wondering, is Python a safe choice? Is it a safe choice for them to learn? Is it a safe choice for them to use to deploy major mission critical applications and projects? To help answer that at the international level, there was a booklet. How many people have seen this? A few, yep. So that's pretty good. But we thought we need a local version because uh, sometimes people say things like, can I get uh, graduates in New Zealand? Uh, issues like that. So at the last lightning talk, we said we'd make a booklet and here it is, which you've all got. 
Okay, so my part of this is just to explain that there were an awful lot of people involved, that many people gave their time. Um, probably first and foremost, there were nine companies that were willing to talk to us and tell their stories. Uh, Ag Research, Catalyst, Canonical, Fisher & Paykel, Harper, Leapfrog, Roofing Industries, Yellow and Weta. Um, in addition to that, there were people who gave their time to provide feedback and proofread. Catalyst were an amazing contributor in that not only were they providing, allowing Grant to do stuff when um, perhaps he shouldn't have been, and uh, also gave us a graphic designer, basically, and who put the whole thing together. Um, and lastly, you guys and other NZ Pug members contributed because it was money out of surpluses from conferences and membership fees that allowed this to be possible. So thanks very much to all of you. Stop. Now, while this is mainly for decision makers, either in business, people who want to decide for Python, or in education, people who decide what could the students become after they learn Python, we put a copy under your seat. No, we didn't. We put it into the bag. <laughs> <coughs> and you might be wondering, what are you going to do with that? Because, I mean, we don't want to preach to the choir. And um, so I just want to quickly tell you how to use this in a guerrilla marketing style. So at work, you probably have a lunchroom. You just leave a copy there on the table and turn around and just get yourself a coffee and let the rest happen all by itself. <laughs> so we don't even need everyone to read every page of this brochure at all, but we need to start conversations. We want to people to know that it exists and this could be in the teacher's break room or at work, or you might have a customer, a client, um, who could use it. If you can't use it, I don't want to see any in the rubbish bin. Um, so yeah, please do something with it. Um, have a look. There are big names, um, well-known household names, and uh, it also looks a whole lot better than the international one, in my opinion. They got a nice title page, but this one is ad-free and it's got a very nice clean design. So please make use of this brochure and um, distribute and multiply. We have, yes, yes, we have one thousand, we have 2,000 copies all up, 500 are in Auckland, 1,500 are here at the conference. So if you want a box of 200 to take <laughs> over to Australia. We'll tell them all about how fantastic New Zealand is and like how we're dragging our feet. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Oh, thanks. That's, that's a really exciting project. I, I'll have a look at mine when I uh, remember where I put my bag. Um, on deck, we have Gagan Sharma. And here, uh, we have Lee Begg, who's going to be telling us about uh, RecFile and Pi3 progress. Um, your time starts now. Thank you. Um, so I'm Lee, and uh, I've written these two free tools, and we can have a look at them. Uh, Euros are on the last slide. Don't panic. Um, so I'm going to talk about rec file check first. So here, who here uses a re um, requirements.txt file? A pretty common, yeah, good number. How many of you go and check if those packages have been updated regularly? Yes. And that's what I was doing too. So I wrote myself a Django-based website that um, I can upload my uh, requirements.txt files to and it emails me every day when there's a change. And I get an email that looks like this. In fact, this is the Django 1.8.4 update. That happen, uh, happened about uh, two, three weeks ago. So it's really useful to see that I had multiple package, multiple projects that I needed to update. Um, so you can go and sign up. It's uh, recfilecheck.beg.digital. It has a self-signed certificate, sorry. Um, and it uses uh, Persona for Logger, and this was uh, originally done by Mozilla, now in community management, I believe. Um, so you don't tell me anything other than your email address, which I kind of need if I'm going to send you an email, right? Um, so it will get a nice certificate once Let's Encrypt gets uh, um, going, which apparently is now in November. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Um, that's kind of neat. But the other thing I'm going to talk about is Pi3 Progress. This is a website that I've been doing. Um, so last year at PyCon AU, there was a presentation on the transition to Python 3, and they basically said, we're not doing very well. I thoroughly disagree. I think we're doing very well. 
Um, I've been collecting for the last two and a half years the stats on the 200 most downloaded packages from PyPI from a website called the Python 3 Wall of, well, Wall of Shame, but now it's Superpowers. <laughs> um, in fact, it's been the Wall of Superpowers since about 2013. Um, since more than 50% of the packages in the top 200 support Python 3. So I produced this lovely long, getting longer, um, waterfall plot. Time goes from top to bottom. Uh, most popular is on the left. And you can see that by the bottom, it's almost all green. Um, and you can sort of see some lovely patterns like the red mostly goes to the right. And that's generally you know, Python 2 packages that are getting less popular because they don't support Python 3. And the green stuff tends to head to the left. Um, there's a few oddities in there, and there's some really neat things like uh, about oh dear, <laughs> as we're twisted, Stop. <laughs> as we're twisted went to Python 3, or at least part of enough of it is sports Python 3. Um, and there's not too many that say they're only going to support Python 2 anymore. Um, so turning it around so you can see it a little bit clearer, uh, which unfortunately puts first at the bottom. Um, but you can sort of see some really lovely patterns. There's some real oddities in there. Um, there's a much better picture on the website, so you can go see that. Um, but just taking it in percentage terms, uh, we're now about 85%. 85% of the 200 most used packages that are downloaded from PyPI to support Python 3. This is great. Stop. Keep going. <laughs> so here's the URLs. Um, hope you enjoy them. If a full. Hey, thank you very much, Lee. Uh, so on deck we have Simon Salinas. Um, up next is Gagan Sharma, who is going to be telling us about how fast is not furious. It says in brackets, stroke. I don't know. If he'll explain. I will explain that. Your time has started, by the way. So. Not my slides, I have got from my superstar, world renowned neurologist, Dr. Bruce Campbell. He works with me, and I'm not a doctor, but I work with the doctors. I'm a neuroimaging scientist, and I use Python for programming. I thought about delivering a community message at this forum, so let's get started. What this has to do with the Python? A lot. It has to do with everyone, because stroke remains the leading cause of disability in adults. One in six people will have a stroke in their lifetime. 80% of the stroke is caused by the blocked blood vessels to the brain. There are a few other causes, but I'm not going to go through that. There are a few of the risk factors which you cannot control, but there are a few risk factors which you can control. When the clot blocks the blood flow, we have a dead region in the brain, which is called the core, being represented by the blue color. And then when, there is a, when the tissue is at the risk, it is called penumbra, being represented by the pink color on the screen. And it could be saved if we can restore the blood flow as soon as possible. At Royal Melbourne Hospital in Melbourne, we use a lot of different techniques for imaging, but we also use a technique called perfusion imaging for a detailed diagnosis. Some of you may know that. It's a technique which tells you how well the blood is flowing through the region of interest, which is, of course, the brain in this case. And today, we have also presented our work for the medical data visualization. As you can see that here, the blood is the signal is changing at certain stage and it's going back to its normal. At the Royal Melbourne Hospital, we have the clinical softwares which process these images and provide us with this sort of image. The pink means the brain tissue is dead. The green means that it is at the danger and we could save it because time is brain. The first 4.5 to 6 hour is very critical for everyone who is suffering from stroke, so they have to be treated as soon as possible and that's what the research shows. Sooner, the better. So what happens when someone has a stroke? We have to act fast. And what is fast? When you see someone cannot, someone's face is drooping, they can't pick their arms up, their speech is gibberish, it's time to call the ambulance. And when the ambulance comes, doctor, uh, when the patient reach hospital, doctors make a number of, uh, take a decision based upon a number of factors. They can give a clot removal or the clot dissolving drug, or they can take the clot itself out. 
Sometimes they have to put this tenting device in so that they can put that in and take the clot out. And once the clot is taken out, the blood starts flowing normally. But brain can only be saved if we act fast because time is brain. So fast is not always the furious. If you see these symptoms, please call the triple one in Melbourne, I, uh, in New Zealand, I guess, and triple zero in Australia. Thank you very much. I love Fantastically important, um, important message there from Gagan. Uh, Alison Capture is on deck. Uh, Simon is going to be telling us about the unknown code. And his time starts now. Disclaimer, I reside at the bottom of the programmer pyramid. The reason I'm here is because my friend from work brought me to Python. So I'm more like his sidekick in the computer realm. But in the real world, it's the other way around, so I can live with that. <laughs> this means I won't give you the coolest Python tricks. Uh, you're already re really skilled at programming this machine. So I just wanted to provoke your mind for a moment and bring your attention to the code that is happening on this side of the screen. Because we could be great programmers, but uh, we might not necessarily be that great at programming um, our own machine. Thinking about this can be very scary sometimes because it may confront our habits. But I don't want to be the one who confronts you or tells you how to live. So I'll keep it light and simple. And sh I'll show you a few examples that uh, show what I mean. We don't seem to have direct access to this library yet. So we have to make mis mistakes, debug, and so on until we find what works for us to live well. And uh, that is precisely what I mean by wisdom, knowing how to live well, a happy, balanced life with constant improvement. I think it's something we all look for regardless of what we do in life. So my first pearl of wisdom has to do with optimizing your rest cycles. There's some evidence showing that blue light frequencies affect melatonin production and reduce our ability to enter deep sleep. There's even products on the market that help you to adjust jet lags based on this principle. Most of us have our circadian rhythms already messed up since we can't avoid staring at screens during the hours before sleep, if that is the case. Um, you can at least install free apps that block blue frequencies from your screen and they get activated automatically after sunset. I've tried it for a while and noticed less eye strain, and even if it's just a placebo, I'm happy to get better quality rest. We're biologically designed to move, yes, less, and the less of that happens these days, as we spend most of the day sitting in front of a computer. There's a strong correlation between lack of movement and physical and mental deterioration. So I wanted to share my own case because I hate running and I hate gyms. So um, I need to fool my idiot brain with balancing on a tight rope or chasing a ball inside a court to make uh, exercise uh, more interesting than torturing myself in a gym. And um, there are plenty of options, so it's a matter of exploring and finding what's right for you. Good thing is our brain rewards us with um, self-regulated endocannabinoids, so we can seek less of that on external sus substances. <laughs> and even if you have uh, physical limitations or you totally hate movement, you can apparently get away with very little exercise if you incorporate proper nutrition in your life. And well, that's really easy. You just start by becoming paleo, then carnivore, <laughs> vegetarian, then go gluten-free, vegan, <laughs> raw, chocolatarian, canditarian, or what on earth? I find nutrition very hard because of the massive amounts of conflicting evidence telling us what's meant to be right or wrong. So I'll leave up to you finding I'm personally a bit of a lone wolf, so um, that can be comfortable, but not necessarily conducive to growth. And uh, luckily I have friends that push me out of my comfort zone. Uh, for example, I would be avoiding my stage fright right now instead of uh, standing right here if my friend hadn't dragged me along. And uh, I also help him by constantly reminding him to go on holidays and play with his kids because otherwise he would end up taking over the world one day. Be ready to deal with struggle and plan for growth in your life. No one is exempt from a massive loss or overwhelming amounts of grief. This talk was motivated by Russell's uh, lightning minute. talks earlier this year because I've also faced great difficulties in my life and um, that can be paralyzing. His message was to seek help. What I have to say is pay more attention to what I showed in these slides. I won't expand on my own struggle, but I can tell you that it helps if you're constantly planning for growth. So I encourage you to find a source of inspiration to transcend unpleasantness, whether it is in psychology, spirituality, religion, 
group of family and friends, music, Python conferences, or whatever helps you to reclaim your a healthy form of balance and self-reliance in your life. Professional success is important, and I know you're all great programmers, but please prioritize looking after your own biological machine. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much for that silence. Uh, Katie McLaughlin. Katie McLaughlin, you are on deck. That's you. Katie, you're on deck. Uh, and Alison is going to tell us about the mystery object. And your turn starts now. Ooh. Great. So I mentioned this morning that I love weird Python bugs, and I wanted to show you my favorite right now. So the ellipsis came up earlier in the lightning talks. Has anyone seen one of these before? Do you know <laughs> what do you know what this is? This object? Anyone want to take a guess? Say louder. Great guess. Totally wrong. <laughs> so in this case, this is what we get when we have a list that contains itself. So this is the kind of thing you have. You know, x is your list. You insert it into itself. This is how it prints. Pretty clever of Python to not just print forever, right? Um, and so we can tell that this is a recursive list because the first element of x is x. Great. So let's check that on our mystery object. I should say for context, I did not build the mystery object. I found it while rooting around the garbage collector while debugging a memory error. So we'll come back to that. Huh? What? Cool. <laughs> so we try to index into mystery. We find that I indexing in it at position 0 throws an index error. What? <laughs> and in fact, it is of length 0. But it's a list. And it prints like we just saw. It gets better. <laughs> what? <laughs> and again, so I was trying to find a place where memory might be leaking out of the Dropbox client. Um, and I saw this, and I was like, this is super weird. This can't be right. What's going on here? Um, and I started digging around, and then I was pretty stuck on this, so I emailed a colleague of mine who I thought might know, Guido Van Rossum. <laughs> and sure enough, he did point me in the right direction. It turns out that this was not anything that the client was doing. This was built in Python itself. Uh, because, as we know, Python is smart enough to not print forever when it's got a recursive list. It keeps track of whether you're currently in a recursive container print call. So here's the code that's kind of small. Actually, ooh, that's really small. Uh, what's going on here is uh, there's a helper for printing containers that could contain themselves to check if we're currently doing that. And that method uses a list. And that was the list that I had stumbled on. <laughs> and so by any time I was, I was printing it, like there's nothing wrong with the actual object. It was, in fact, an empty list. Uh, but by printing it, I was like modifying the, the representation, and I was getting back this totally garbage thing that uh, looked like this. Uh, and because the same list is used for printing dictionaries to contain themselves, you get the like recursive hash version as well. Uh, so this is actually really easy to find. Uh, get your own, amaze your friends with the strange <laughs> Python weirdness. Um, grab it out of the garbage collector. You do need to print a list in the REPL first to create this thing. Um, otherwise, it won't be there. And then just filter out for uh, length of zero list and eyeball your list until you see it. Um, this reproduces in most versions of Python that I've seen. Uh, if you find one that doesn't, I'm super curious about that. Thanks. No, that was that was very exciting. Um, on deck we have. Oh, you're already there. Great, fantastic. Uh, Katie is up next. Who's going to tell us? Oh, who's going to yell at us about JavaScript and its attempt at global variables? And her time starts now. Woo. I'm Katie. Here's two JavaScript books. The one on the left is JavaScript, the one on the right is JavaScript, the good parts. 
So, if you've read my speaker bio, the last bit of it says that in my spare time, I enjoy cooking, making tapestries, and yelling at JavaScript at its attempt at global variables. I was writing my speaker bio when I was dealing with this kind of stuff. So if we have an answer, our answer is an empty string. We have a function which has an answer that sets it to the answer. And if we were to call the um, variable answer on our console, we would get the empty string because we haven't actually run our function yet. If we run the output of our function to the console, we get the answer that we're expecting. And of course, if we try to output our variable again, we get the empty string. Because JavaScript likes to do things in Java, and Java's awful. So the top one there is actually global, but the var in the middle of our function is actually local. And they don't really tell you this, and it's really annoying when you find it nested 12 functions deep in your great big Java script application. So what you're supposed to do is either make everything global, or everything local, because JavaScript, like every other language, has it at default global, because it doesn't. <laughs> but JavaScript also has duck typing, which is really annoying, because if you say add two numbers together, four plus two, you get six. And you can reverse that, so you can go four minus two equals two. And because type safety, you can do four minus two is two. And four plus two, which is of course 42. <laughs> <laughs> because Java, because we have the assumed types, and of course the one that's the strongest overtakes the other one. But then you've got a raisin object. This can't be too bad, right? What do you think this is gonna be? Empty string. <laughs> an array plus an object. An object, well that makes sense. So if we reverse that, because associativity, it's gonna be zero. <laughs> and then if you add two objects to get together, it's not gonna be a number. <laughs> Wat. So if we want to start actually playing around with arrays and objects, we can initialize an, ar an array, that's ABC, and then if we wanted to say associate a key, hello, as in world, um, it would do that, and then if we wanted to print out the array, our association would not be there anymore. However, if we were to iterate through our array, it would be there, <laughs> because JavaScript, and if we were to append something to the array, we would get the number four out, and if we were to try to print out uh, what the actual count of our array was in our own counter function, it would be five, even though it's four, <laughs> because JavaScript, and equality, which is gonna be really fun, because, of course, zero is equal to false. No, it's not. It's not equal to false, because you have double equals and triple equals, because you've got the same with true as well, where you have a one equals a one, no, it doesn't actually equal a one, because of type coercion, and this is awful. Always use a triple equals, unless you're doing type stuff, um, because any language that there has to be a triple equals as opposed to an actual equals is awful. And this is just frustration script, um, and when it's the glue that holds together the web, it's like, ah, but it's okay. It's getting better, because there's this thing called ECMA script six. How many, how much time do I have? Uh, one minute. One minute, okay. So the old way of doing things, you would have to declare a function empty brackets, but now you can do that in a couple of less characters, so that's cool. And in the old way, you would have to declare a local variable, and now you can use a let, which is completely the same but different. <laughs> and in the old way, if you didn't have a variable in there, you would have to assign it if it was empty, but now you can actually have a default parameter, which is kind of cool. And you can have constants where if you try to reassign the same constant, it'll explode at you. And you can do things like having the automatic expansion of an array into different local variables, which is kind of nice. And you can import JavaScript from other JavaScript files, which is awesome. And you can do things like you can have a, a, a function that takes as many parameters as you want, which is cool. AMA6 script is not yet ratified, but unlike Python 3, you can actually use it now <laughs> because there's a compatibility. <laughs> Depending on what browser you're using, you can use one or more of these functions, check the table, because uh, IE and Safari and all the awful ones don't do it, but the nice ones do. And that's the end, thank you. Yay! <laughs> okay, that was Katie. Uh, up on deck we have Lee Symes and Grant Payton Simpson. Uh, Robert Collins is gonna tell us all about pip constraints. And his time starts now. Great. Cool, so pip constraints. Who here uses requirements files? Great, Who, keep your hands up. Who here has more than one source tree that they work on? Right, you shouldn't be using requirements files. You should be using constraints files. They're the same thing, but better. And I'll just move my mouse to the right place so that this actually, oh, right laptop, that would help. <laughs> right, so you go from that 
to that. You pull your project name you're installing out of the requirements file and you keep everything else exactly the same. The content stays the same. And this just says, if you're going to install a thing, choose this particular version of it. So super, super simple. Um, gives you all the reliability of requirements files. Obviously, that's why you want to do it. it. As I just said, it doesn't apply installation. But the big thing it does is it saves coordination problems across multiple trees. We're doing this in OpenStack, which is what we built it for. It's in upstream pip. And it's really, really, really solved the, the problems we had. Because we've got about 40 different project trees we install. And doing a separate requirements file for each, which is what we were doing, does not scale. I'm amazed we got to 40 before we actually had the pressure to fix this. Um, if you're not using pip, you should be. Not a good enough reason. If you can't guarantee pip 7.1, you should probably rethink your life choices. Modern versions of pip fix a whole bunch of stuff. Do I have time to keep going? Yeah, go. Cool. All right. So Three minutes. One more slide. Use pip 7 plus. It is really the best thing since sliced bread. Um, we've got wheel caching. So if you're installing NumPy, who here uses NumPy? Are you using um, Conda or something like that? Yep, great, nice and fast. If you're not using Conda and you're not using distro package, you're saying, I'm going to pip install NumPy, probably makes you cry. And that means your version of pip is too old. Because if you've got seven, it will build a wheel once, cache it, and every install after that will take about three seconds. So that's really where you want to be. Um, if you are using your distro pip, stop using that. Use the pip from getpip.py. Um, yep. Cool. Uh, thank you very much, Robert. Uh, oh, we're on to the next page. Uh, Kara, you are on deck. And up now we have uh, Lee and Grant who are going to argue that coding is punctuation. Your time starts now. Oh, thank you. Um, well, Grant kind of chickened out. And then Yay! <laughs> Stop. So it's just me. Um, so I'm basically, um, hopefully if I get my computer set up all nice, So what is the most used character in Python 3 standard libraries? Um, and I used IPython because I wanted to learn IPython. Um, so let's load up the standard library and find out um, if I can get my, hey, does that work? Yes. Um, so the most common character is, drum roll please, space, um, <laughs> followed by E, which is really exciting and everything, but uh, not quite what we were after. So uh, let's get rid of the boring ones. And um, we're left with underscore, followed by full stop and a couple of others. And why is there 50 more closed brackets than open brackets? <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Um, so Smiley's in comment. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope so. Um, so what does that look like in the graph? Um, this was my first attempt at writing matplotlib. Um, so thanks, Grant, for putting up with me. Um, looks kind of cool, doesn't it? Um, yeah, so uh, this is why programming is so hard. A lot of the time you do not spend typing symbols, you just type letters. But programming, you do a lot of time typing symbols because that's what we use everywhere. So um, if you're having problems teaching people how to program, remind them that symbols are hard and you need to know where they are to make it easy. Um, so other interesting things. What about numbers? Um, well, we use a lot of zeros, which I guess is all right, because zero index, yay. Um, Python really doesn't follow the law of what numbers should be, but it looks kind of interesting, right? Um, other interesting factoids. How many tabs are in Python 3? Uh, any, know, any guesses? Huh? Zero. zero. None. <laughs> Four. <laughs> Um, and just for the curious, um, there are 94 different non-ASCII characters. Um, thank goodness we have UTF-8, right? So um, here they are in lovely printed form. So that's all cool. Um, thank you for Grant for coming up with the idea and XKCD, obviously. Um, hold on, dependencies. And just in case you were wondering where on earth those tab files were, 
Oh no, it stopped working. Yay. Oh look, we didn't get text. So um, <laughs> that was my thought, exactly. So that's me, awesome. Yeah, um, cool. So uh, Jeremy Stott, uh, you're on deck. Uh, Kara is gonna tell us about Honk? Hark. Hark, Hark, not Honk. Handwriting. Yes. Your time has started. Okay, uh, don't use Linux on the desktop. <laughs> 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 so, uh, who's walked through this beautiful campus and seen the duck? Read from the yeah, yeah. I mean, it's basically like there's a photo of a duck and then my slides to read, so it's fine. Um, so, yeah, sorry about that. Um, I'm a systems engineer, which is a, a, a ridiculous role to have. Basically, it means that you're expected to do engineering and systems administration. But it's actually, from what I can tell, it's becoming much more kind of popular role uh, in companies like where I work. And everyone talks about DevOps and so on. The problem is there's all these experienced application developers who actually have a lot of trouble upskilling with the, the system side of things, I've found. And it really makes it hard for us to move people inside the organization onto our team. Uh, and I started to think about who do we think all these ops people and systems people actually are? So there's this kind of playful stereotype of like the grumpy, bearded people or whatever. Uh, I mean, oh, that's ungenerous to sysadmins. But it also actually contributes to the culture of kind of exclusivity and toxicity that I think like so many people have seen in, in systems teams. Um, and engineering teams. So uh, this is the slide where it just says the word quack, uh, and I'm hoping that Christopher will quack for me. I do not quack on demand. <laughs> okay. Why would I do that? Okay, so yeah, I saw these beautiful um, ducks on the way in this morning. <laughs> uh, apparently they're not related to Australian ducks, supposedly. And you can tell because they make ridiculous sounds. They don't actually quack. They kind of do this weird like <laughs> thing. And we were chasing them through and having a lot of fun <laughs> making these sounds. And I have to apologize for anyone who was in the keynote this morning while it was getting ready. You would have heard me trying to <laughs> and, and stuff like that. It was pretty good. Um, and this is of course what I tweeted at Chris just to kind of uh, some quack onomatopoeia. Um, so I hope everyone gets to see the ducks before they go if they hadn't. And where I'm going with this is that if a loose unit like me, who's literally chasing ducks around the campus, making squealing sounds at them, and then doing that in the keynote, can be on a systems administration team, I think we need to revise the stereotype of what kind of people move into roles like that and have those skills. How much, how long do I have? Oh, you have two minutes. Oh God, okay. Uh, I was, okay. I was going to demo a tool that I have essentially written to help people um, get dropped into a shell easily. Uh, the inspiration came from it at the PyCon AU sprints last year, where we were trying to do a salt thing, um, and we had an incredible amount of problem just getting everyone dropped into a Linux shell with some dependencies installed. And it's because it's not actually easy to give someone who doesn't have that much technical experience uh, a virtual machine to spin up. So essentially, I've created a project that I'm calling Hark, which is a little bit like Vagrant, but it's essentially configuration-free, uh, like there's no configuration format, it's interactive only, and the project itself actually vendors all the operating system images that you'd want to run. So it, you know, you can run up a FreeBSD image or Ubuntu or Debian or Fedora or whatever. It runs on Windows and OS X and Linux, and the idea is that you can just give the person this one, um, you know, operating system package to install, and they run this one command like hark new, and it takes them through the whole system setup of the machine lets you SSH into them, manages them for you. You don't have to mess around with knowing your working directory like Vagrant. Um, and essentially the goal is to create a tool that, that teachers uh, or tutors can use to kind of get people up and running with a box in VirtualBox or, or VMware or whatever um, uh, more easily. Because I find that it's a nightmare to be juggling, you know, you send someone an ISO and you're like, just follow the, you know, go through the install wizard in Ubuntu and answer its questions about partitioning and decide whether you want this Ubuntu or that Ubuntu. It's just nonsense if you essentially want to teach someone some basic bash. And um, I guess the, the obvious use case for it for me is that I have several friends in the arts who I help kind of learn coding stuff, like some of them are doing linguistics and they often need 
to install various native packages, you know, stuff like um, like SciPy or whatever. Um, and it's it's really hard for them to get up and running because they all use Windows quite reasonably. Um, yeah, so I can't actually show you the slide that has the link. It's called Hark because there's a great web comic called Hark a Vagrant, and my project project is kind of inspired by Vagrant, but it's trying to make things a bit easier to use. Um, it's not a Python project, but it's kind of for people learning Python. Yeah. Hey. Okay, so um, thank you, Kara. That was fantastic. Uh, Danny and Tommy, uh, you're on deck. Uh, Jeremy is going to tell us about DI Pi slides. And his time starts uh, now ish. Cool. Cool. I'll just see if this can work. I can almost read that. Well, hang on a second. So DIY slides is a great idea. write some slides for my talk and of course instead of writing the slides I figured out why don't I write a slideshow program because <laughs> none of the uh, sort of reveals Google slides I just oh no that's not uh, that my slide is not going to look good in that um, so as a way of procrastinating I wrote the slideshow program um, it's for presentations and it's written in Python so you can do things like that and you and you can have progression like that and you can have titles titles are neat uh, and you can have ASCII art images. Uh, you can g you can go back as well. So so it's back, next, previous, and you can use lovely colors, background colors, great colors. I only only added cyan because of my logo. One of my logos needed cyan. Um, and you can go back and overwrite text that you previously had, and you can make the whole slide green. <laughs> Uh, and so they're inspired by Presenti. Uh, if any of you at the, uh, Linux Conf, you uh, in Auckland earlier this year, last year, this year. Um, so James Blair wrote Presenti, and I thought that was really, really neat. So I wanted to write one myself. Except uh, I like electronic stuff, so I wrote one to run on a microcontroller. <laughs> I can't answer that question. There is there. Ooh. So that's plugged in over here. And uh, all the slides are actually just a TTY interface to the microcontroller. So that ripple that you saw before is actually on running on the microcontroller. Um, and so what does the program look like? Um, you can pretty much, it opens up a slide that's on the SD card and searches for some keywords, replaces them. Uh, I've, got a, I've got a generator there, it's kind of cool. Uh, there was a, a, another section here that sort of took my next print back and that's actually pretty much it. Uh, there's some ASCII, uh, some ANSI colors. So this is how all the colors work. It just searches for those terms. I had to put an underscore because I haven't worked out escaping yet. Um, <laughs> and it just basically replaces it with those ANSI colors, which is what makes your terminal look really cool. Uh, so this is actually running on my microcontroller right now. And it's a Python 3. Uh, I think it's almost complete implementation of Python 3. You can do uh, none of the standard libraries, just the, just the language. So. What do the slides look like? So you can see there, you write your slides as a text file, presentations in Python. I've got my title thing there. That's just search replace for that ASCII art bit. Uh, and we've got that reset, which goes back to the beginning of the slide. And you can then go and 
add your pauses in. Pause just splits up the slides uh, so that you can add your, add your progressions. Um, some of the things like introduction look really cool. <laughs> so that's, I've generated that that introduction picture. Uh, would you believe it? Is that? Did anyone see the resemblance? <laughs> so I didn't actually have license to. Oh sorry, guys, don't look at that. <laughs> I didn't have license to use that, um, but I'm not sure if computer-generated art. Uh, I don't know who owns that now. In 15 seconds. Yep, that's pretty much it. Cool. <laughs> okay, uh, Caitlin Duncan is up on deck oh. next. Uh, Danny and Tommy are going to tell us about why NZ Pug is splendid. Is that the title and, you put down? And their yeah. time, their time starts. This lightning talk again. Hey, I was pulled into. We this get, we get one, uh, we get one of these recurring lightning talks that, that show up every year. At every I'm wasting your time, by the yes, way. You should be talking over the top. You're of right, me. brothers and sisters. <laughs> um, Kiwi PyCon is so much fun. This warm, fuzzy feeling. I want it again. And um, what can I do to help? You ask yourself. <laughs> The New Zealand Python user group, and repeat after me, is not a mailing list. The New Zealand Python user group is actually an incorporated society, a not-for-profit organization with a committee that meets and spends time on doing things like organizing a conference or, you know, having an annual general meeting. I know that the majority of you were not at the annual general meeting because I was there and there were only about 20 or so on IRC, that was, of course. And... Um, hmm? We had the quorum, just. But um, I would like to invite you to join us. There are branches in Auckland, Hamilton, Christchurch, and uh, it's surely at some stage in Dunedin. I'm in Dunedin, so that's all you need. And <laughs> in Wellington. 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 And Wellington. we have meetings every month. And um, yeah, please join us. It's a very nominal fee per year that helps us run things. And uh, we need to be more. And um, you can help us grow. So speaking of Kiwi PyCon, next year. Hello. <laughs> Hi, tell me how are you? I'm going to tell you a story, but I'm going to do it very quickly because I don't have a lot of time. In 2011, I attended my very first Kiwi PyCon. And it was wonderful. And I attended, I, it was in Wellington. And I attended with a man who's not here today, so I'm going to make fun of him, and it's going to be great. Um, some of you know him. He's called Tim Penhay. And he took me along to Kiwi PyCon. He said, oh, you really must come to this conference. It's going to be amazing. And during the conference, there was a little meeting in a back room, and Danny was there, and the rest of the NZ Pug committee were there. And the discussion that was being had at the time was, who's going to organize next year? And Tim said, hey, Tommy, we should do this. He said, we. <laughs> and I kind of said, oh, how hard can it be, right? Like, I don't know, you throw some people in a room and magic happens. The next thing I knew, I was literally standing in the middle of the room with everyone around the wall going, yeah, yeah, Tommy's going to be conference director in 2012. <laughs> and it was the hardest thing I've done in my entire life. It almost killed me. It was good though, right? Who, who was there in 2012? Awesome. So, who has had fun this weekend? You should all have your hands up right now. What I would like you to do, Marek's not in the room right now, hopefully he's not <laughs> listening too loud, but I would like you all to have, after, the, after he gives his closing, to have the loudest, rowdiest round of applause, standing ovation, carry him from the building, <laughs> because it's his first time doing this as well, and it's an incredible amount of work. You'll notice there's bags under his eyes, and he's, you know, kind of not all here. It's entirely <laughs> understandable. I'm telling you this because after 2012 happened, I swore I was never going to do it again. Guess who's Never running again. next year? It almost killed me. After 2013, I was resolute. I said, no, 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 no. Never again. That was a lot of work. After 2014, I thought, ah, maybe, like, if things got a bit easier. 
And so it is One with a minute. certain amount of trepidation that I announce to you all that PyCon next year will be in Dunedin, and I am sadly organizing it. <laughs> Yay! Stop! If you would like to help out, that would be great. Please come and talk to me. If you have amazing ideas for what we should do next year, please come and talk to me. There are a few other people in the room who have foolishly agreed to help me. I wonder if you could stand up for a second and, and make yourselves known. Who's here? Chris, Bob, come on. Who are Tom? You're there as well, come on. All right, so you can also talk to these people. We will need lots of help because you know we're programmers, we're terrible at event organization. But through random chance and good luck and a lot of goodwill, Dunedin will happen. It will be excellent. I would love to see you all there. Thank you. Okay, so uh, up on deck we have Fraser, uh, and our next presenter is Caitlin Duncan, uh, Duncan rather, who is going to tell us about uh, Code Club. That's Tom. I'll, I'll, I'll let Tom log in. To unforeseen technical. Di nah, that's 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 unfair. Yeah, I can start without the slide anyway. Yay! Cool. Okay, hi everyone, I'm Caitlin, and um, I want to talk to you guys today about Code Club Aotearoa. Has anyone here heard of Code Club? Hands up, a few of you. Or is anyone here involved with Code Club? Woo, we have some volunteers, that's awesome. Okay, so um, Code Club, for those of you who don't know, is a network of uh, after-school coding clubs for kids in New Zealand that's part of a wider... That's not my slide. <laughs> It's part of a wider worldwide network, started in the UK, now there's Code Club World, and we've got Code Club Aotearoa going now. <laughs> the idea is we don't really have uh, programming computer science in the education system that much yet. We've got it in the final years of school, and if the Ministry of Education listened to me and my supervisor, hopefully it'll be in primary school soon. <laughs> but until then, there's a big demand. Well, we don't really need it, it just had the website on it. Just play quicker. <laughs> hey! <laughs> Is this it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> give a big hand for our AV person. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan's very hard working. Hey. I've already said most of it. <laughs> okay, so anyway, um oh. <laughs> Code Club NZ is the website. You can also find us, I think, yeah, at Code Club NZ on Twitter, and uh, and my Twitter will be up there soon as well if you want to contact me through that. Um, the way it works is loads of skills and loads of kids who really want to learn this stuff. It's all really new to teachers, and teachers are ridiculously busy, so they don't really have time to learn this stuff very easily. So what we want to do is partner industry volunteers. Hey! We want to partner industry volunteers, like all of you who already know programming and know a bit about that stuff, with um, teachers in schools or other volunteers who don't have that programming language but want to get things going, parents, everyone who wants to be interested. Um, it's for about eight to 12 year olds, but we're kind of lenient on that. Basically, if they want to learn to code, we want to um, help them be taught. Um, our goal is to, by 2018, have a club available to any kid in New Zealand who wants to learn. doesn't matter where they live, where they're from, and they're w we want this club to always be free. Unfortunately, that doesn't mean we have a lot of money to pay people who are working on it, but hopefully that sorts itself out at some point when the government gives us money. But until then, we really need more volunteers doing clubs. Um, it's really fun. The teaching materials are in Scratch and Python, so that's always good. And um, we really want to get more of these going because everyone who does them really seems to enjoy them, and we want the next generation to get more into software and get New Zealand going into the future. Thanks. Um, so, we only have one more left, which is Fraser Tweedale, who is going to tell us about network-bound encryption. And his time starts now. There. Hello. Yep. Okay. Um, so, who's deployed a web server with TLS? Show of hands. Okay, keep your hand up if you have the private key sitting around unencrypted so that your server can come up without an operator entering the password. There's yeah, still quite a few people. Okay, that's bad, uh, don't do that. So, 
I'm going to bring up a, uh, a web server on this host. So zip it to gold start, HTTPD. Oh, look, I have to enter the passphrase. Um, okay, good, it's up and running. And now the server has uh, had to be rebooted or something. And we have to enter the passphrase again. Uh, or do we? Um, so in this directory here, uh, data.d, I'm going to encrypt the passphrase for the server. And then it's going to be able to communicate with a decryption server to automatically decrypt the passphrase for the encrypted private key on this host. So I'll just do a um, deo uh, encrypt dash a etc uh, ipaca. So this is just a trust anchor. Um, the deo server, which is uh, f22 3.ipa.local, and we're going to save this to uh, f22 4.ipa.local port 443 which is uh, how it will find the file um, to send to the decryption server when the server comes up. And uh, now put in the passphrase, which is super secret. Okay, and now if we have a look here, we've got this file, the encryption file, and I'll bring the server up, system control start, httpd, and uh, the server's up and running. It didn't have to prompt us for a passphrase. Um, and so the idea of this is that you can have your decryption server uh, on a secure network, firewalled away from the rest of the world. So hosts that um, need to decrypt private keys uh, or other secret material that are on your secure network, on a trusted network, can do so without operator intervention. Um, what else could this be used for? It could be used for disk, disk encryption. So if you've got fully encrypted disks in your data center, um, your disk encryption can... Uh, you, the system can automatically decrypt the disk uh, without operator intervention and come back up. So uh, I'm going to do that now, and I've never actually done this before, and I, so hopefully it's going to work. Uh, so I'll bring up this host here. It's going to prompt me for the, uh, for the disk encryption password, and hopefully it's going to come up quickly. How much time do I have left? Oh, two minutes. Two minutes, all right. See how we go. Right. Uh, whoops. Bring up the terminal. Uh, just embiggen that. Okay. Uh, Deo uh, crypt set up. Uh, what's it want? Uh, D, uh, it'll be dev SDA2, hopefully, uh, anchor, let's see, uh, IPA, CA.cert, and the target F223.ipa.local. Ah, oh, um, okay. SDA? No. SDB2? Oh. Hey! Ah, I can't see anything. Become smaller. Smaller again. Oh no, I've maximized it. Oh no. There's an SDA there. SDA? Yeah. Ah, oh, flip. <laughs> yeah, SDA. One? Oh, I don't know how this thing works. Anyhow. Um, oh, sudo. Oh, that's a good idea. Hey. Okay. Uh, decrypt. This is Unix. Set up dash D dev S D. It was A S D A two dash A at C I P A C A dot cert F twenty two three dot I P A. I P A dot local. Enter any passphrase. Uh. <laughs> 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 okay. Um, that's doing its thing. Oh, we're out of time. How does this story end? You'll have to ask Fraser uh, in the break. Uh, so, uh, that is the end of our lightning talks for today. Uh, there's been 18 of them, and I think they've all been pretty fantastic, so let's give all of our presenters a huge round of applause. <laughs>